I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the OCHN uh, webinar for SCD waiver. And most of you said that you can see my screen. So the first screen that you should be seeing is about the webinar code of conduct. But before I get into that, I just wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on the OCHN website because the idea is we really want the STD waiver training to be available year round for any new um, people who join the teams at OFS and Easter Seals as well as Oakland schools. And if any of you also would like a refresher, then you will uh, you are welcome to look at the presentation. Um, it will be in the under the training section on the OCHN website. So let's get started. So the code of conduct, basically all participants will be muted and just to cut down background noise. Please use the chat box um, to write down any comments. There is a chat box underneath. You should be able to see the chat box. So how it's going to work is that Kim and I are going to be alternating uh, between sections. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box. Marissa is going to be helping us out. Marissa Keels from Oakland Schools, and she is the lead wraparound facilitator. She would be she is going to be monitoring the questions and she will let us know your questions at the end of the training and then we will um, take some time to answer your questions and have some discussions. Having said that, I do like to have our trainings be a little informal. So Kim and I are going to be going back and forth. You may even hear from Marissa. You may even hear from Cassandra. So um, uh, we, we are a team and we work together on the SCD waiver. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of like a joint effort. So welcome to ev welcome everyone. I really appreciate you guys taking time and joining this training. It is very essential that we had this training and I'll go into um, it a little bit later on. So going back to the conduct, um, there is going to be uh, co closed captioning. English only is available through the full downloaded computer version of the Microsoft Teams as well, and it gives you instructions on how to manage the toolbar. So let's get started. I just moved the slide. Can you see the can you see the next slide? OK, awesome. All righty, so as you can see, you can see our pictures. Kim and I will be your presenters. And if some of you may know me, some of you may not know me because I don't work a lot uh, closely with the therapist. Uh, Kim is works a lot closely with the therapists and wraparound facilitators than I do. So my name is Nida and I am a provider network analyst at OCHN and basically in a nutshell what I do is I oversee the contracts for all the children's services so that means I oversee the contract for Easter Seals Children's Services OFS and as well as Oakland Schools which is wraparound um, and I work very closely with Cassandra from Easter Seals and Uriel and Katie and Lauren and Debbie from OFS and I, uh, Marissa, Holly and Susan from Oakland Schools. And Kim, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, like I said, I'm happy to see most of you join because I've actually had some type of interaction or consultation with most of you that I see signed in today. So that is wonderful. That just shows the collaborative um, efforts we make in Oakland County. But for those of you who um, I may not have had any contact with, I um, am the SED waiver coordinator uh, for OCHN. So I'm a little bit more hands-on involved with coordinating and determining eligibility for the SED waiver in Oakland County. County and and um, I also work pretty closely um, with the other individuals that Nadai's identified, Cassandra from Easter Seals, Katie from um, OFS. And I have probably, out of everyone, now that I think about it, um, with the exception maybe me and Marissa are running neck and neck, probably have the most long-term involvement with the um, SED waiver um, 
going all the way back to show you that, um, like I saw Debbie Smith, for instance, um, that Nadab mentioned to Saigon. She was actually uh, one of the collaborative partners when I first came on to the SED waiver. So I got a little bit more history as it relates to the waiver. And I'm glad that you guys are here today and welcome. Awesome. Uh, the other person we work very closely with is Brittany Stone. She is our collaborator with MDHHS um, and she is uh, represents Oakland County. So we work very closely with her as as well. And we'll go into um, what exactly her role is in a little bit as well. So looking at today's agenda, what we're, we will be doing is uh, having a brief overview of what SCD waiver is, the eligibility determination application process, where we will talk about Medicaid applications, wraparound and home-based therapy, recertifications and terminations or denials, um, choice voucher, ABA, any questions, and then we will have our contact information listed at the end uh, in case you guys need to contact us for anything. So first of all, what exactly is um, SCD waiver? So SCD waiver is administered by MDHHS and managed by PH PIHPs. In Oakland County, we are a PIHP as well as a CMH. Um, so basically, um, the main person when it comes to uh, working with the state for SCD waiver would be I, and then anything that is related to SCD waiver in the county, uh, Oakland County is usually Kim and then um, then me as well. Provides in home services and supports to children with serious emotional disturbances and their families and it's available currently in all 83 counties. So this is something very new as of 10 119 it was available in all counties prior to that it was only selected counties that were providing SED waiver. It is now managed care and the waiver itself began back in 2005. So some of the covered services is CLS, community living supports, family home care training, family support and training, uh, some therapeutic activities, ex like rec therapy, music therapy, art therapy, respite care, therapeutic uh, overnight camp. Uh, we also provide transitional services and wraparound, wraparound being the mandatory service under the SED waiver. And we will talk about it in a little bit more, more in detail in a little bit. The next thing I want to talk about is that there's two specific categories that we work with in SED waiver. The first is the traditional population and then we have the DHHS project. And what exactly is traditional population? Now the interesting thing about Oakland County is that we have the highest number of traditional cases, which means that we have a lot of biological families who are on the SCD waiver and they're using the SCD waiver to support their children with all sorts of SED concerns um, and we are helping them in their homes all over Oakland County. So this is children living with legal parent guardians may already have Medicaid or children living with parent um, legal parents or guardians and do not have Medicaid. So then SED waiver becomes a pathway for them to be enrolled in Medicaid. The next category is the DHHS Child Welfare Project, and this is any children open with um, the foster care system through MDHHS or children who are adopted out of the Michigan Child Welfare System. Now, I do want to mention we do have some children with international adoptions as well that have um, that we are working with in Oakland County. And then the DHS Child Welfare Project, basically each county has uh, 
has a person designated for SED waiver. Now for our county, Kim is the uh, lead person for SED waiver, and she also has some hours at the DHS, local DHS office. So she works very closely with foster care workers um, who are looking for extra services for uh, individuals in our county. And Brittany Stone, like I said, also works at MDHHS and they work together. And if there is a local um, referral from MDHHS that they think they want to refer to SED waiver, then they will contact Kim and they will have a discussion to see if this could be a potential candidate. And if so, then Kim will um, go over the eligibility criteria and then a referral is made. All right, uh, I think you are it, Kim. Okay, um, and before I start talking a little bit more about the eligibility determination and application process, just want to go back and clarify something that um, that I mentioned earlier, because she mentioned that, which I'm sh I see a lot of you who are already signed in are aware that we do have kids who have been adopted internationally through um, and are on the SED waiver. Just wanted to be clear that those would be considered under the traditional population, which is what Nadal was covering at that time, because as far as the referral process, there's different paperwork required for someone who was an international adoption versus someone who was adopted from the child welfare system. So just wanted to clear that up. So with that being said, we're going to jump right into eligibility determination in the application process um, here in um, Oakland County. County in um, Oakland County, we're um, OCHN, as Nadab mentioned, as the PIHP and the CMH, we are responsible for uh, determining eligibility for the SED waiver. But as you guys are aware, which you'll hear me refer to a lot, um, we operate from more of a collaborative approach here in Oakland County. So um, we are pretty dependent upon you guys to not only help us, you know, identify someone who's um, eligible, but to also, you know, give us that um, valuable clinical feedback when someone is seeking the um, SED waiver um, here in Oakland County. So we're going to talk a little bit about residence wise. Um, in order to be eligible, it's important to note that the child must reside with either a birth or adoptive family member or have a plan to return to the birth or adoptive home. So that would be in reference primarily to not only foster care kids, which um, we briefly mentioned and we'll talk about more later on in the presentation, but that could um, also be biological children who may be away in a residential, which we see frequently, or uh, the family may be moving back to Michigan. So there are um, just wanted to add that, that there are a lot of different um, circumstances where a child may be eligible based on their residence. Of course, they have to reside with a legal guardian or um, they could also be residing in a foster care home with a permanency plan. It's important to note that the SED waiver is available for a child through the age of 21, but they must be 18 when approved for the SED waiver. So just um, wanted to point that out for you guys to keep in mind if you make a referral for someone who's, you know, right there at that 17 and a half, have to um, make sure we're, um, we have that case submitted to MDHS as prior to that child's um, 18th birthday. Okay, and now what is the actual eligibility requirement for the SED waiver? Um, the child has to meet current MDHHS criteria for state psychiatric level of care. Here, and I believe, don't want to jump ahead, but I believe we have a link to that um, particular criteria uh, coming up in this presentation for you to view. Um, that I outlines the MDHHS criteria for state psychiatric hospitalization. Uh, and also it's important to note that a child also either has to already have Medicaid to receive the SED waiver or they have to meet the Medicaid eligibility criteria to become a Medicaid beneficiary. Um, 
So just wanted to point that out because I know we have had a case before, I believe, where there was a dual citizenship and that is actually not a qualification for the SED waiver. So something to keep in mind when you're working with children and families to identify their eligibility for the SED waiver. Okay, and now I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit more about the clinical tools that we utilize in Oakland County to determine eligibility. Um, and we have different tools that we utilize meaning our contracted providers based on the child's age. For anyone who is age seven through 18, we utilize the CAFIS assessment tool. And on this slide, you see what the CAFIS score would need to be for a child based on their age range. For a child who's seven to 12 years old, the child has to have a CAFIS score of 90 or greater or for those who are 13 to 18, the CAFIS score must be 120 or higher. Higher. Um, Want to take a little bit of time to note this would probably be more specific to Easter Seals Infant Mental Health Program that children under the ages of three to seven, we utilize the CAFIS and not the PEFIS. I want to emphasize that. And that the child only needs to score a 20, which is a moderate impairment in one of these three areas that I'm going to go over. So if a child has at least a 20 in self-harming behaviors, moods and emotions, thinking, communicating, or behavior towards others, that child would be eligible for the SED waiver as far as the CAFIS determination. And they do not have to have a score or, or 90 of 90 or 120. So just wanted I, to point that out for that particular population. Kim, you were using the word CAFIS instead of PECFIS. They have, for the IMH kiddos, they have to have a PECFIS. Thank you for clarifying that because I did say CAF, CAFIS, I mean, I did say PECFIS at first and I did revert back to CAFIS. So thank you for that correction, Cassandra. So. Let me say that again, that a child must only have a moderate impairment in one of those areas on the PEFIT assessment tool. Okay, then we're gonna go on. I'm not sure if most of you are aware that we have kids um, on the SED waiver under the age of three as well. L. Um, and the youngest we've had thus far has actually been a three-year-old, but wanted to make you aware that a child can be on the SED waiver as young as the age of two. And for the age of, of two to four years old, um, which that's actually incorrect, as I look at that on this slide, didn't catch it during our first presentation. So, um, because a three-year-old, we're going to go with a PECFIS. So two-year-olds are only the uh, age that we currently use or we look at the DECA uh, assessment during this time. And we look at the protective factor skills, which identify the child's abilities and initiative, self-control, and attachment. And we're looking at a T-score of 40 um, or below on the DECA as well as whether or not the child may have elevated scores on one, a minimum of one, it only has to be one though, I wanna emphasize that, or more of the behavior concerns of the 32 scales that are listed on the uh, DECA assessment tool. And those scores um, we're looking for has to have a T-score of 60 or above. Once again, this would only apply currently to Easter Seals Infant Mental Health Program. Yeah. So then the last slide simply talks about um, an overview of what we talked about for first um, so far as far as eligibility, making sure the person is a resident um, here. In oh, no, Kim, I think we lost you. Medicaid eligibility. You can't hear me? Okay, now we can hear you. Okay. okay. Can you just begin with this slide? Sure, can I no just problem. ask, I, for some reason, I'm seeing the presenters, I'm not seeing the slides. And should I, is there another screen I should be looking at? I 
I'll let you address that in the down. I'll go ahead and reiterate this slide to move on. Can everyone see the slides? Cassandra, can you see? Can we now see I can see the slides before okay. I was only seeing the presenters. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. OK, I was going to ask that we see a show of hands or comment chat. Looks like a lot. Mostly everyone can see the slides. Is that safe to say? OK, great. All right. So um, just summing up the eligibility uh, requirements overall is on. The, that's the current slide we're in is to verify that the, they do meet the eligibility requirements of an Oakland County resident, that they also meet the current MDHHS criteria for psychiatric hospital level of care, Medicaid eligibility, either meet the current CAFIS, PECFIS or DECA criteria. I see we have DECA missing off of this slide. And want to just reemphasize that it's important that that child is under the age of 18 when approved for the SED waiver. Other um, eligibility considerations that we would like for you guys to take a look at um, when working with someone on the SED waiver is uh, their diagnosis. Does the child have a primary SED qualifying um, diagnosis? We're going to talk a little bit more about other considerations for diagnosis later on in the presentation, but that's where we're, we're going to start with, which um, ideally for most of the people that you're working with, um, that should be a qual that should be the qualifying diagnosis. But of course, as we know, we work with some pretty complex children in Oakland County, and there are um, kids who have our dual diagnosis, well, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation. It's also important to note that they must receive hey, at least. I'm sorry. They lost the slides. On my end, the slides have disappeared. I don't know if that happened to anybody else. Like the, yep. the presentation is not showing anymore. We lost the slides. Now we see people instead. Something's going on. OK, can you see the slides? Yeah. Oh, God. OK, sorry about that. You all are good, though. Other considerations, please note that they must see at least one SED waiver service other than wraparound per month in order to retain eligibility. Um, so let me take a brief moment. Don't want to go on that too long because that's something that we probably will have to talk about in another training, which we've kind of identified after one go around with this. But mandatory is currently the um, man only mandated service for wraparound. I mean, for excuse me, for the SED waiver, but they are also required to participate in any of the other ancillary services as well. Um, currently, um, for those of you who are already working with the SED waiver, you're probably aware that some families choose to not um, have home-based or outpatient services through our providers. And I just, and right now, I believe that's something that MDHHS is looking at and evaluating this, but know that when they come for eligibility ass assessment, that I am always advocating that they do participate in therapy services with our core providers. One, because we have, um, I think some of the most well-trained therapists throughout the state and our providers are always taking initiatives to get other quality certifications. And I do encourage that, but know that it's not, um, that it's not, in, you know, um, required for that. So keep in mind too, when a family comes on that eligibility is good for a year. Um, so you want to ideally start with, discharge planning, which I think is in most of our services during the intake, because the ideal is to look at how we can get this family, the, well, not the family, the child specifically, but the supports for the family, you know, stabilized in a year and be able for those people who have traditional insurance or in the traditional population, hopefully be able to kind of transition them back to their commercial insurance. And just to know that eligibility is reviewed annually by the SED waiver committee that Nadav mentioned earlier. 
and that um, we ultimately are looking at the MDHS criteria when that happens. And now I'm going to turn it back over to um, Nada, I believe, at this time. Oh, no, excuse me. I misspoke. So we are on just that criteria I was talking about. If you notice, there's a link in the bottom of this slide that has the MDHHS inpatient admission criteria. And that is what we are looking at here at OCHN as well as our providers um, when we make an eligibility determination for the um, SED waiver. And that um, it's actually broken down to one that qualifying SED diagnosis that we mentioned, and then there they only have to meet one category under the severity of illness as well as the intensity of services. And I just wanted to take a minute because I saw a something which I don't know said a good question. Um, so I, I wanted us to stop I was, br briefly. I was going to hang on to them if you guys, okay. you guys okay. want me to do. Or you want okay. me to just ask I just you. saw the good question. No, let's, let's, let's do the go questions ahead and, in the end. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're going to keep that at the end. So you you have that good question. <laughs> down, Don't forget okay. the good question, Marissa. I got it. I wrote it down. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much, Marissa. And now I'll turn it over to Nada. All right. Okay. Welcome back, friends. So I will be going over the SCD waiver application process. As Kim mentioned that we work, um, Kim and I both mentioned that we work very closely together. So we have an SCD waiver committee. Now this is something that is per the state. There's a particular method of how SCD waiver has to be approved. Um, and like I said, this is guided by MDHHS. So this is not something that OCHN came up with. Um, this is a process that is followed in every every county. So for SED waiver, we have an SED waiver committee. The people who sit on the committee is Cassandra from Easter Seals, Katie uh, Kiner from OFS, Brittany Stone from MDHHS, and Marissa Keels from uh, Oakland Schools, and Kim Brown. She is the one who will present the um, applications and I am uh, there as a facilitator and um, we basically make up the SED waiver committee. We review all the applications. We look at the eligibility criteria that we have provided you the link for um, and based on that alone, as well as CAFIS score, it is determined if a child is eligible for SED waiver. And if they are, then the family is referred to wraparound and a provider of their choice for intake. Now, we have two providers in our county, o OFS and Easter Seals, and we allow the families to decide which provider they would like to go with. And in most cases, they always choose uh, a provider based on their address and location. And then, then we, um, OCHN Access Department is responsible for completing the application for SED waiver. And once it is all done, done, which is the family assurance form, we will go over it in a little bit. It is uploaded into Odin. That is something that when MDHH just comes for their audit, they always look at those applications to make sure that we have uploaded them uh, and have a record. So it's very important to make sure we have those applications. If for whatever reason the child is not eligible, then a hearing notice is provided to the family and this is handled again by the access department, which is basically Kim. Now I will be talking a little bit about wraparound. So wraparound, as mentioned earlier, is the only mandatory service under the SED waiver. So when a child and a family are eligible and begin SED waiver services, they have to have to have wraparound. They cannot choose not to have wrap they can't choose not to have wraparound it is a mandatory service and wraparound is a highly individualized planning process performed by specialized trained wraparound facilitators we have wonderful facilitators that are working at Oakland schools um, 
that work not only with SED waiver children, but also uh, other children who have wraparound because you can have wraparound without the SED waiver as well. And wraparound facilitators main job is to coordinate the planning for and delivery of services and supports for the identified individual. Uh, they utilize family and child team uh, with individuals determined by the family who are representing multiple agencies. We have had wonderful success stories of therapists and wraparound facilitators working together with families. Um, also, they create the home-based therapist and the wraparound facilitators wraparound child create a highly individualized plan for the child and the family. So this is something I do want to elaborate. It is a very essential and this is something that uh, is a huge point when MDHHS comes for audit and we have had some issues with this in the past. It is very important that when you receive a new referral for SED waiver and you begin working uh, as a wraparound facilitator as well as a home-based therapist that you work together in coming up with the IPAWS for the family. Uh, because what we have been seeing is that the IPAWS for wraparound are different and the IPAWS for home-based therapists are different and they do not mesh well together. And this is something we get audited on uh, and not do very well. So it's very important that whatever goals are were um, put in the IPAWS by the home-based therapist should be reflecting whatever goals are in the wraparound IPOS plan as well and vice versa. That is essential. Um, they should basically mirror, mirror each other. The other thing that's very important is that the home-based therapist must always have a goal for wraparound in their plans. Um, otherwise, that is also something that we will get cited on. So it's very essential that the wraparound facilitators and home-based therapists work together. And the reason is that traditionally speaking, um, the SED waiver case technically is um, the wraparound facilitators should be the holder of the case. Um, but technically in our county, we do things a little differently, um, which is was cited prior to myself as well as Kim. And in our county, it is the home-based therapist that is the whole holder of the case. So that is why it's very essential for the home-based therapist to work together with the wraparound facilitators. So they're also wraparound facilitators are also responsible for orienting the family of the SCD waiver, uh, making sure that you reiterate that waiver is a Medicaid covered program and the family must apply for Medicaid for the identified child and the family has to wait for MDHHS to mail out their Medicaid packet. It's basically a Medicaid application with an SCD waiver sticker on it. We've had families in the past who will just download the application and fill it out and mail it and it has been rejected by the state so they're very particular about this it has to be their application with their sticker that is completed and then um, mailed out timely and that's very important because especially for those traditional families who do not have Medicaid this is a pathway to Medicaid so they have to have Medicaid otherwise um, those are services that they could get billed on we've never billed anyone but it is a possibility Also, wraparound facilitator is responsible for collecting evidence of adoption whenever applicable. And once you do get that information, it could include changes in uh, courtship, courtwardship, uh, adoption, and hospitalization, even address change, name change, any of the sort, you have to have to let Marissa and Kim know or one of them know so they can go ahead and make the changes in WSA. Now, some of you may know what WSA is, some may not. WSA basically is the MDHHS's EMR for SED waiver and all the other waivers. So there's just a little background. There's a couple of waivers that we have. We we have ABA, the autism waiver. We have have waiver, have waiver, which is um, or HSW, which is basically for the IDD adult population. And then we have the CWP, which is the IDD children's population. And then we have the SED waiver. Now, 
the children's waiver have as well as ABA can last for a few years. People can have them for a very long time, especially CWP and HAB. Whereas SAD waiver is very particular that it is only for a year and every at the end of the year, it is reevaluated if the person is applicable, uh, meets the criteria, sorry, for another year or not. So it's very important that the wraparound facilitators are monitoring their progress and letting our team, the SED Waiver Committee, know when it's time for recertification of how the family and the individual is doing. Um, every year, if they do end up getting recertified, they will again have to fill out a Medicaid application. So this is a yearly process for the family. Now, like I said earlier, you have to be working very closely with the uh, home-based therapist and also wraparound facilitators are very much responsible for transition planning along with the home-based therapist once it once a family is transitioning out of the SED waiver. So a little bit of home-based therapy, like Kim mentioned before, we definitely recommend families to um, work with the home-based therapist from one of our providers, but we have had cases in the SED waiver where families have chosen to work with their private therapists or therapists that they're already working with, um, and that is okay. Um, and then in those particular situations, if that is what your family is stating, please, please, please speak to your lead, which would be Cassandra at Easter Seals and Katie at OFS in regards to those situations. So home-based therapists must uh, make sure that they read the SED waiver access screening completed by access. And this is something that I am highly recommending because we've had a lot of issues with um, families that have, when they go to the provider and start, and the provider starts working with them and we look at the IPOS and when I'm looking at the files or when I'm audited, auditing, I'm looking at, I start from looking at Kim's access screening and I see that Kim has identified all these needs needs or concerns with the family. And then I look at the intake and they have identified sometimes a different set of needs. And then I look at the home-based therapists IPOS and then I look at the goals and sometimes they don't reflect any of them and sometimes they will reflect some of the stuff from either of the uh, screenings. So it's very important that you are um, going and reading the access screening just so you have an idea why this family is looking for the SED waiver and why this family has come for the SED waiver and what was the criteria that determined that they're eligible for an SED waiver. I also request the intake staff when they are, I know they're super, super busy and super swamped, so I completely get it, but it would really help our families if the ther intake therapist is aware of the access screening and um, the screening criteria that Kim has used and, and, and the eligibility criteria that was used to base our decision on why this person is eligible for SED waiver. Um, because we because when MDHHS comes and does their audits, they're looking at that progression. They're looking at that golden thread from starting from the access screening all the way to the progress notes. Are we seeing the, the golden thread or not? And that's very important, not just when OCHN is auditing, but also when the state comes and audits us. And home-based therapists have to add authorizations for wraparound as well as other services because they are the case holder. Um, the wraparound plan and the home-based IP IPOS should reflect the same services, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the things um, that Cassandra, you can feel free to speak about as well, or even Marissa, uh, one of the other things that um, we got cited on was that that when a wraparound facilitator, let's say, is meeting a family every other week and then, you know, the family starts doing well and um, they're seeing gains, so they end up only seeing the family, let's say, once a month, but the home-based IPOS will have a wraparound goal that states that the frequency is going to be every other week and it hasn't been updated to once a month. So 
when the state comes, they're even looking at that, that whenever wraparound drops down or increases, that the home-based therapist is doing an addendum and following through with that. Um, either Cassandra or Marissa, you want to speak to that? Yes, we did. Um, that was a very big concern with um, MDHS when they did the audit. And I know that our services are person-centered. So, you know, the family might state they want to, to do a service a certain amount of times per month, but we also want to take in consideration what is the family actually doing. So, you know, we definitely need to look at the previous authorization in ODIN to see what was utilized. And, you know, if at one point for four encounters per month was authorized, but the, the family did not utilize all of that service. And the question becomes when we authorize the next time, are we going to authorize four encounters per month? And so we highly encourage therapists um, when you're doing your periodic reviews and um, before you're authorizing a service that you are coordinating with the RAP facilitator to determine what's medically necessary for the family, but also keeping in mind what is the family actually going to do? So the state is holding us accountable to what the family actually does and authorizing what they're actually realistically going to do um, of amount of services per month. So, um, you know, really ma mapping that out with the family and authorizing what they're going to do. If we need to do an addendum to add more offs, we can always do that. But um, we, we just need to make sure that they match, that the, um, the treatment plan matches, the frequency matches the authorization. And if there's any changes or significant event that occurs mid-treatment, that we're doing addendums to, to match that. I second all of that. Um, and I also want to add, um, as far as SED waiver kids go, we do have the ability to see them less frequently if things are going well. However, if we get to an SED waiver review and we have a kid who's being seen monthly, it is a very hard sell to the state to say, yeah, we're only seeing them monthly, but we really feel like they need another year's worth of services. So um, if the kid's needs are high, the frequency of meetings also need to be high. So we have to work with the family even though their preference might be for less meetings to make sure that we're also in there to help them um, and we're in there to help meet the needs. So the frequency of meetings should correlate with the level of intensity and the crisis, et cetera. So that coordination piece is huge and also making sure the families understand um, the function of wraparound services and that the frequency and the um, level of need are in line with each other. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. OK, and with that, I think my section is done. Kim, it's you're on. Yes, and um, before I move on, I just wanted to add to what has already been said. And before we move on from eligibility, um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate um, and share something else that's unique about Oakland County. Um, Another one of the things that is very unique to Oakland County is we get a lot of our SED waiver referrals from our providers, because, and that just speaks volumes um, to the excellent work that you guys do with your families that you hate, that you're kind of able to, you know, identify this family is struggling and they can um, benefit from a higher level of services. But before we go on, I know there's also that comes along with that um, because of our um, uniqueness and collaboration in Oakland County that families may hear about the SED waiver and they may not actually, you know, appear to meet eligibility criteria. So I just want to reiterate that it, that's where you guys are important at. If a fam, because when a family request, we're kind of um, obligated. We, we have to, once they make that request, we have to move forward with the assessment and eligibility process. But what I think is important to note here is when you're, you have a family and some of those things are going on that Cassandra and Marissa just spoke to where they're not utilizing the services that are already in place for starters, have some conversation with that family and, and, and let them know that this is a high intensity level need um, program and see one, if they're willing 
to participate in that. And two, sometimes they may not just have a clear understanding of the SED waiver. So I just want to reiterate for you guys to kind of take time and find out why that family is asking, of course, and 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 why they are looking for the SED waiver, because they may have an understanding of what it entails. And you may be able to implement some other services or supports that that will be beneficial to the family um, without overwhelming the family because at this point the family is right above hospitalization ideally with the SED waiver so just wanted to share that and of course you can't tell <laughs> we don't want you to tell people you can't have it to get it without us actually going through the eligibility process that we just identified which means OCHN completing the eligibility assessment and taking that to our collaborative team so just wanted to add that point before we move on okay so now we're going to talk about the actual application process for the SED waiver. Um, and on your screens now is the waiver certification and family choice assurance forms, um, which is the actual application to apply for the SED waiver. And not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you see, it actually has um, a summary of what we've talked about so far. Um, has the child's demographics, uh, you see at the top, we're expected to check which subcategory the child is uh, participating it in. It has those CAFIS uh, determinations we talked about, as well as mentioning that the child meets um, the MDHS contract um, criteria for state psychiatric hospitalization. And, and, and by saying they do that, it shows where we recommend it and CMH is completing that part, but then I want to talk a little bit more about the Family Choice Assurance um, form, um, which is what the family actually signs and completes and that you would be reviewing um, with the family prior to making a referral. On this form, it states that the parent understands their child is eligible, because by this time, you should have already had some discussion and dialogue about what the SED waiver offers and whether or not the child and family could benefit from that. But more importantly, I want to focus on the second line of that application because it states that they are agreeing to participate in the SED waiver and work with home and community-based services in lieu of state hospitalization. And why I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that is because we often have um, parents with children on the SED waiver who are requesting state facility applications through our providers. So I wanted to point that out to you guys so you can remind the uh, parent, well, hey, you know, when you asked for the SED waiver, or we recommended it and reviewed it with you, you, you kind of agreed to allow us to work with you and provide additional support to keep your child in the home of the community. So keep, so keep in mind that, you know, let them know when, when they do that, they're willing to work with that. And I say that because we just talked about how families may have four um, services per month, uh, not four per month, but four, let's just say wraparound meetings, for example, to keep it clear cut, authorized, but they only participated in one or two. So now, we would like for you to take that opportunity in and discuss that with the family. Now, because I, we understand emergency and crisis happens. I know sometimes that happens because people are hospitalized or the family has crises. But for those where they just weren't engaged, you know, we we challenge you at that time to talk to that, you know, to talk to that family and say, well, we have these services available. We've offered this. And I know you declined it in the past, but would you be willing to look at that now that your, you know, that your child's circumstances have changed? And I, uh, so just wanted to point that out now as well. And as far as the Medicaid application, which will be coming up um, soon as well. So pay attention to that and just that's a good talking point for you when you're working with your families. Now we're going to move on to who can actually sign the family choice assurance forms for those under the traditional subpopulations, it's pretty straight cut. That child's um, parent or legal guardian will sign the form. Um, with, with foster care kids, a little bit more 
complex, but um, no, which I want to reiterate during this, is in those cases, because with foster care kids, those kids have a certain level of care on the DHS side that they have to meet as well. So I, I meaning OCHN, we really wouldn't even expect the providers, meaning Easter Seals or Oakland uh, Family Services, or Oakland Schools, to really kind of obtain the signature for these kids. But uh, And if you do, it would be more in your group collaborative meetings because it's important that the foster care uh, parent or child knows that by signing up for the SED waiver, they're not only agreeing to participate in these services, foster care also has a parent service agreement that they're agreeing with on a level four basis too that they're going to complete. So I, I, I really put the responsibility on the foster care worker in those cases to get this form signed and, and explain to the family what they're signing up for when they agree that they want to participate with the SED waiver. Okay, can you go ahead and move to the next slide for me, please, Nadai? Thank you. And and I did do that a little prematurely, just wanted to reiterate that for permanent. But like I said, I, I want the foster care um, worker to assume responsibility here. And they should be working with wraparound and Oakland schools and Easter Seals in these cases. But there's not there's no signature necessary on that previous slide if the child is a permanent court ward or an MCI ward. So now we're going to go in and go into detail about the approval process. So now we have a completed, we have a completed packet. We've talked about the case at, through the SED Way Collaborative. The child has been presented with um, wraparound. So, so what happens next is important for you guys to know as well. L, OCHN at that time takes a completed packet. We submitted in the WSA, which is the MDH's S, it's electronic medical record system. And once I submit that in there for OCHN, it is then submitted to Nada who reviews it as our PIHP he, um, and here in Oakland County. And then she forwards it to the DHHSQ. DHHS reviews the information um, provided, provided and reviews the packet and they approve they approve the case and Nada, Marissa and myself, we all receive an approval email when that happens. And that process um depend outside of the pandemic, <laughs> let me re-emphasize that it's usually pretty fast. We see on an average anywhere between one to two week turnaround once um that leaves Nada's queue and, and is headed to the PIHPQ. So, but all three of us actually received the email um, that the case has been approved and what the um, approval date is, is. And then at that time here in Oakland County, I take the approval letters. We have an SED waiver smart sheet, which some of you are familiar with because you've uploaded referrals there, even though I believe most of the time Katie or Cassandra gathers the information from you and uploads it. But I have seen a couple of uh, therapists utilize it and add to that too, which um, I, I just want to commend you guys on that once again, because you do some great work. So that that approval letter is uploaded to the smart sheet. And then um, I will let Cassandra and I know Katie was on last week speak some as far as what she does with the approval sheet. If you could tell us very briefly once that approval letter letter is added, what what do you do, Cassandra, or what's expected from the therapist at that point? Sure. So with Easter Seals, once I get notification of the approval letter, um, I scan it into our um, Iris system. I'm also doing a contact note in Iris indicating that we received the, um, the approval letter. I go ahead and change the benefit plan. Uh, because on the letter, it will give the effective date of when SED waiver started. So I go into Odin and change the benefit plan to SED waiver effective the first of the month of whenever the approval letter stays on that form. The approval letter will also indicate what type of SED waiver it is, whether it is traditional DHS pilot or adoption. Um, 
But I also go into the FAS website, which is the CAFIS and PECFIS website, and I add that label um, to the uh, the CAFIS system. And um, I also make sure that there's wraparound added as an evidence-based practice in the CAFIS system as well. And then um, I'm emailing the therapist and the supervisor instructions of early terminating the regular wraparound, which is the H2021 that was already authorized, and um, doing an addendum to add the H2022 wraparound. Um, and in that email is instructions to do. Did we just lose Cassandra? Do that SED waiver objective, SED waiver wraparound. So we have to make that switch. And then also in the email, it's just reminding the therapist to coordinate with the RAP facilitator about that Medicaid application and that families are filling that out. So, and also in the last thing I do in IRIS is that there's a section where it has billing notes. Um, I'm putting a little note that shows at the top of our screen at IRIS when the SED waiver is expected to expire because it's approved for one year. So if you ever need to know when it expires, you can reference the approval letter that was scanned in the chart, and you can also look at the billing note flag that's at the top of the screen. Thank you very much for that, Cassandra. And I, I do know that Katie do, does a similar process as, um, as well. So for if you're on here from Oakland Family Services, um, so, but Katie would be the person to follow up with if you are um, are not aware of what the process is. But um, I do know I've, I've had extensive conversation with her and she pretty much duplicates um, what Cassandra just explained. So um, why are we spending time on that? Mo going ahead, moving forward with the current slide. Um, is because this is going to eventually lead up for those traditional cases to the Medicaid application. Now, um, for cases where there are already in OCHN services, this would, you know, this would not apply, and this wouldn't apply to foster care cases as well, because foster care children also already have Medicaid. Okay, but that traditional population does not. And I'm, I'm having you follow this time frame to want to see how quick it is and two for the wraparound facilitator who's um, actually charged with this responsibility but because we work together so well here in Oakland County um, just want to reiterate that um, we're looking for the home base or the outpatient therapist support in this as well as when you're having those weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings with those families it's following up on whether or not they receive that medicaid application um in the mail and the time frame we're looking at now is actually about 30 days but it it typically happens a lot quicker keep in mind i'm not speaking for the pandemic so you need to put extra time on there because i noticed we have snail mail going on right now and the fact that mdhs staff currently is on um a layoff where they are only down to a four day work week. So that may extend these times out, but I still want you to use those time frames as a guideline. So once the uh, Medicaid application is received, received um, the parent and guardian needs to apply for the Medicaid application. I want to reiterate something that I said earlier, please have the parent to please wait on the actual Medicaid application that is mailed from Lansing. They can identify that because it has a pink sticker on the outside of the envelope. Please, please, please incur tell your family not to go ahead and be proactive and apply for the Medicaid a ahead of time wait until they get that application. Um, the wraparound facilitator is responsible for assisting the family with completing the application once it's received. Um, and if you guys are great at that, I'm sure too, because I know a home-based therapist wears many hats. Um, feel free to do that as well. But the idea here is that we want to ensure that that application is completed in a timely manner um, based on previous experience. If they don't have it back within two weeks, MDHS has been known to say, fill it out all, all over again. So I would say go with a week. Make sure that that application is completed and submitted back to MDHS. Our method, method that we prefer is through fax. Um, I know that 
present some challenges right now. And I'm talking to the wraparound facilitators, but Marissa, I encourage you to go to Marissa because she has reported that um, there is a way to get that done even in the pandemic. But um, we prefer that it's facts because one, we're eliminating a couple of days that it takes to travel through U.S. postal mail. And two, we have actual confirmation that that Medicaid app application was completed and submitted in a timely manner. Other things to note here before we move on, if the family has any medical expenses that would be covered by Medicaid that has occurred up to 90 days prior to the Medicaid approval, not the SED waiver approval, but the Medicaid approval, there is a box for them to check on that application to be um, reimbursed for those services. And this would also apply to our providers as well, because sometimes you get a kid and they have their psychiatric review and there's a medication that may not be covered by that by their commercial insurance. And currently providers are expected um, to ensure that the child receives that medication and then they are expected to submit for reimbursement to OCHN. So you would that that is also another motivating factor for you to make sure the family checks that box to make sure that your respective agency um, ha, um, has checked that in order for you to be reimbursed if you if your agency incurred any costs related to that child's mental health services um, prior to that Medicaid approval. Oh. Okay, I think you can let's see what are we on. I think that I hit that go really quickly because I had my talking points. So yes, medication application has been submitted. It has been submitted correctly and approved. So now that family should have received a Medicaid beneficiary ID number, Amber. And it is the wraparound facilitator's responsibility to provide that number to Marissa, who will then enter it in the WSA, which also then goes to Nada for approval and ultimately ends up for MDHHS to approve that that Medicaid number is a valid Medicaid number for that child. And now we are able to be reimbursed or pay for any services that are provided under the um, SED waiver. And I think we've already kind of talked about those outstanding medical expenses. So if you can move on to the next slide for me, please, Nata. Other um, considerations um, and challenges that we find with the Medicaid application is to make sure the parent knows that they must apply for Medicaid for the identified child. We've received correspondence back saying that the parents have did follow the application to the letter of the law, but for some reason, either the child was not identified or the child was placed on the wrong spot with the Medicaid application and the Medicaid application. So please be sure that it's clear that the family is applying for Medicaid for the child who's receiving. SED waiver services, have this in here again, just want to reiterate that parents do not apply prior to receiving that approval packet, packet which comes through the mail with the pink sticker and to be sure to add any supporting documentations and follow the directions with the packet. There is also a, another um, nice document that we have that we got from the state, which are parent tips for um, applying for Medicaid. I know that everyone on the collaborative team has that, so I want to encourage you, if your family is struggling, to reach out to your respective SED waiver collaborative team meeting to get a copy of that uh, parent's tips on applying for Medicaid. And one of the other issues that I think we hear a lot, and hopefully we'll get feedback from you guys at the end of this, is we hear parents are reluctant to provide supporting documentation because they think that they're going to be denied Medicaid. But that is not the case because once a child is approved for the SED waiver, they are, they are automatically assumed eligible for, me, for Medicaid, specifically for SED waiver mental health services. So while the family is expected to include all of their financial information, let them know that it will be waived and will not be used in the eligibility determination for the Medicaid. 
Hey. Other um, last on here, which I want to point out, is Medicaid numbers related to adoption. Occasionally, we have kids who are adopted while on the SED waiver, and when a child is adopted, they will be assigned a new Medicaid number regardless of whether or not their name changed. So it's important that the wraparound facilitator obtains that um, newly assigned beneficiary ID from the adoptive family and provide that to Marissa to be entered in the WSA in a timely manner. Other things about Medicaid, a, know that once Medicaid is approved, the Medicaid is good for a year, which is annually. And if a child continues on the SED waiver um, for a second year, the family will receive a Medicaid annual determination, redetermination, let me make that clear, application. And I want to stress that while it's on the wraparound facilitator to ensure that, if we can utilize our home-based therapists either to check around that recertification time and ask your parents have they received that, um, please encourage them to receive it. It's basically only a two-page form. From what I've been told by MBHS, it's really a matter of checking a couple of boxes and signing and returning it back um, in an envelope that is provided with the Medicaid annual redetermination. So please encourage your family, your parents to fill that out and not disregard that or throw that in the trash, which is what um, some parents have actually reported that they have done with those. And another um, important thing I want you to look at is when we are getting ready to disenroll a child from the SED waiver right now, um, our standard practice is to start the disenrollment process a minimum of 90 days as before the end of that eligibility please be sure to check the Medicaid status prior uh, to us having that discussion so we can ensure that Medicaid is active and in place so that OCHN can receive um, reimbursement for services that have been provided for that child. Okay, now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit more about adequate proof of adoption. Um, which is significant around the Medicaid process, which I touched on briefly with um, the SED waiver. So this usually comes up at two different points throughout the uh, SED waiver process. Right now, I'm going to focus on the uh, initial eligibility determination. So when you submit a packet and a child has been adopted from the Michigan Child Welfare System, there is a letter that's included in OCHN's intake packet from Access that has a, that has a letter um, asking to verify that the child was adopted. And I, and I jumped right into that letter. I want you to notice that because if you're looking at this slide, you see there's a copy of the Michigan Adoption Subsidy Contract. Most parents are not able to locate that unless the child was recently adopted, which also happens. Happens. So, but in the case where they're coming for the SED waiver, and um, and they haven't had that service before, more than likely they've already had that child adopted for an extended period of time, and they're not going to be able to lo locate their adoption subsidy contract. So, it's, I would suggest you not even mention that. That you just provide them with the letter on the next slide. Kim, we can't hear you. Hello, Kim? Yes, I can hear, but you said you can't hear me. Yeah. Okay. Can now you hear can me? Hear you. Can you yeah. hear me now? Okay. Um, now, yeah, now. Let me know when I go out because I sound clear on my end. Thank you. So, so I would just actually have the child's fa family complete that form and upload this form to the smart sheet, and that will allow me to um, obtain the evidence of adoption that's needed to move forward with those cases. Cases. So just wanted to emphasize that because I think sometimes a lot of time is spent on waiting on the parents to get that adoption agreement. So just simply have them sign this form and, and then OCHN can pick up and get any necessary documentation from that point. 
now um, let's move on and feel free if there's any questions around that because I know there is something to please put them in the chat or save the questions for the end but we'll go ahead and move on to talking about multiple SED waivers in a, a single fa single foster home and in some cases that can happen um, in a legal guardian um, home as well because I do know we also have that cert that situation occurring currently here in Oakland County. So I just want to emphasize that it's important to remember that the wraparound is a family focused service. And before a family applies for the SED waiver for another child in that home, that we would like for the wraparound facilitator as well as the home based therapist to collaborate and look and see if that other siblings need can be identified and met by an existing, you know, team. So meaning if you're already in that home and you're working with one child, but you see there's another child um, that may be eligible for the SED waiver, have a discussion with that family and maybe even a powwow, you know, just among the clinical team yourself and say, are we able to meet this child's needs um, without the other child having its own wraparound case and in this case for the purpose of discussion SED waiver case okay? and could that be done in best practice if the needs are so severe which um, like I said we do currently have that in Oakland County that that's fine go ahead and move forward and follow you know OCHN's eligibility um, determination process um, with that child but we just want to reiterate and have you keep in mind that if there is more than one child in a family or household on the SED waiver that they must each have their own separate wraparound case and that you must meet the requirements for each child as an individual. individual. So be sure to emphasize that to the family as well because that's a lot of contact and people coming in and out of the house because keep in mind that when you meet the eligibility requirements for the SED waiver, we're basically saying your child meets hospital level of care according to uh, MDHS psychiatric level of care criteria. So that what does that mean? That means that each child in that home on the SED waiver must have their own wraparound plan. Um, in our case, their own IPOS, which is an evaluation of their own strength and needs assessments, as well as their own individual you know, outcomes, as well as their own individualized team meetings that you know are consistent with the frequency of team meeting requirements that's outlined in the Medicaid manual. So just just keep that in mind. Um, if there are, are more than one ch uh, child in the house that may be eligible or approved for the SED waiver. So now let's go back and focus more on submitting those the changes, changes, um, and why that's important uh, for the SED waiver. Some of the common changes that we have here in Oakland County, name changes that would be primarily specific to uh, our foster care population because oftentimes an adoption does occur and is finalized while the child is receiving um, services through the SED waiver. Uh, sometimes, most of the times, I find the child name does change. So it's important that that information is committed. Committed communicate it, excuse me, to, to Marissa or myself elf, in a timely manner. Even if there isn't a name change, a Medicaid number, which is the second bullet point, is, will occur once the child is, a, is adopted. So it's important to note that we need an end date for their pre-adoption Medicaid number, meaning the Medicaid number while they were in foster care, that, that's usually going to be the last date of a month. So we are going to need the what month that the um, pre-adoption Medicaid number uh, ended. And then, of course, we know that the first day of the following month, that ideally that should be the date of the new Medicaid number. Very important to submit that because that impacts um, billing and reimbursement for the SED waiver. And the next um, bullet point also goes along with category changes because at this time when a child is adopted, adopted, 
they are now going to um, be moved to either um, traditional SED waiver or they may be a DHS project but adopted from the child welfare system. Nonetheless, we have to make sure that information is added in the WSA. Hey, so that's why we're kind of uh, reiterating this and hitting on the importance of it's actually the wraparound facilitator's responsibility, but if the home-based therapist, if you happen to get that information, we will not be upset if you get it to us. Um, because speaking for myself, and I'll let Marissa jump in at the end, I don't care whether I get it from the wraparound facilitator or the uh, therapist. What I'm concerned about is getting that information in a timely manner. Um, moving on to that, um, court wardship changes are important as well. Also, though, strictly to a child that's on foster care. So a child may start off as a temporary court ward, but the parent doesn't follow through on their treatment plan. And now the foster care worker has went to court and the child has been made either a permanent or MCI ward. It's um, important that um, we know that as well, because that's one going to determine who signs that family choice assurance form that we mentioned. Eh? And then more important, Importantly, it, it may impact the funding source as well. So please be sure to communicate changes of that sort um, to either Marissa or myself. Any um, air dress changes in particular, I want to emphasize at the beginning to make sure that the um, air dress and electronic medical record system is adequate or, or um, because sometimes we have Medicaid applications because they have moved in the middle of the uh, approval process and they're going and the family's not receiving it because either it went to a previous air dress or incorrect air dress. So please verify air dresses. Um, when a child is on the SED waiver, um, inactive statuses. Very, um, very, very important. It has recently um, changed as well. Hell, um, with the um, SED waiver, anytime the child is out of the home for a 24 hour period, you want to let the wraparound facilitator know. Oh, but in order to be made inactive right now, which I believe we're covering that later, so I, I won't go too much into that. They have to be out for a specific time before anything needs. But I just want to reiterate, anytime a child leaves, we have a couple examples, hospitalization, that, and I want to emphasize that includes when a child is in the ER for multiple days or weeks. That, that would count, even though that's not an actual hospitalization. But if the child has remained in the ER and not been at home, we are starting at the first night that the child did not return to their home. Child could be AWOL, the child could be in a detention center, the child may even um, be, um, I think in some cases we have now, out of the um, out of the home visiting another relative or parent which, and not with their legal guardian. So we would want to know in those cases, but we would discuss whether or not we're going to make the child inactive within our collaborative team. But I just want to emphasize any time a child is out of the home. We need that to be communicated to the collaborative team. Tr SED waiver transfers. If the child is moving to another county within Michigan or they're moving out of state, um, primarily though this is related to um, moving within Michigan. Now that SED waiver is available in all of our 83 counties, counties we're going to need that information so we can work on tr facilitating a transfer and making sure the child will have adequate services in the county that they're moving to. So, yeah, so now a little bit more about that um, inactive status. While we want to be notified as soon as it occurs, there's uh, there's not really an impact um, to the SED waiver at this time until the child has been out of the home for a full calendar month, um, meaning not 30 days per se, but a full calendar month and some other days. So for example, today we'll take it to make this simplify this. Let's say a child went out of the community the community today on the 23rd of July. We would want to be notified of that um, immediately, but this is where we're going to start tracking because if that child has not returned to the home by 
September 1st, we are now responsible for making them inactive because that means this child has been out from September 23rd through the end of July, but as well as all of August. So as um, then that's when we need to look at making that child inactive and depending on the reason for the inactivity, that may also ultimately lead to um, disenrollment from the SED waiver. waiver. But um, nonetheless, please notify us immediately once that um, has occurred. Um, when a recipient is made inactive from the SED waiver, you know, we, the PIHP, which is OCHN, we will continue to receive payment for the duration of that time. However, you know, the um, specific managed care payment will be suppressed until the inactivity period ends. So just want to stress why that is um, important. And then at the point, they say inactive for 90 days on here, but 45 is actually the mark we look at because we want to look at if a child is expected to return to their home within 90 days. And if that doesn't happen, we usually start the disenrollment um, around 45 to 60 days if there has not been a time identified for the child to come back in 90 days. Let me see. Yep. So I think we've covered everything on the current slide, um, except for let's get to the fourth uh, bullet point. So in the example provided on the slide, I the child does um, become active or return from being AWOL or from the ER or from hospitalization. Um, Marissa or myself will make them active again and waiver services will continue, you know, as normal. And then I won't harp on the last two parts because that would be, that's specifically related to OCHN. Yeah. And I, and just to reiterate, kind of already talked about it. We're not going to make them inactive technically when they're out of the community for less than a month, but we do need to know when they are out of the community for tracking purposes to make sure if they happen to stay out um, longer than the 30 calendar days that we can make adjustments um, accordingly. And last point I want to uh, know, which we're be greatly dependent upon you guys for, if we already know they're, they are going to be out greater than a month, we can make them inactive right away. So that may be for cases where sometimes a child is put in a residential placement. And the parents say, well, they're going to be there uh, 60, 90 days, whatever. If we know it's over that period of time, we can make them inactive right at that point. So the more information that you guys give us, um, the better we can be at being compliant with making sure we update our inactivity status. And now I am going to turn it over to Nada, who's going to talk about the recertification process. Okay, thank you so much, Kim. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm trying to speak as loud as possible because a few people said I wasn't loud enough. So what exactly happens when we are doing recertifications? So for recertifications, like we kind of mentioned earlier, we have um, the SED waiver committee that looks at the individual again, um, if the individual still continues to meet criteria, then we will um, to have a discussion. And if they are approved based on the MDHHS criteria, then SED waiver lead, which is Kim um, or Marissa in this, is in this particular uh, area because Marissa now handles the recertifications. She will enter the recertification packet into the WSA and then it comes to me to approve and then I submit it to MDHHS. And recertifications, it is a yearly process. And we are really trying to stay on top of them. So we start looking at cases at least 90 days before their recertification is due. And we're collecting as much material as possible because uh, MDHS has certain requirements, especially if a 
if an individual has had the SCD waiver for a few years and this is going to be their second or third recertification, then we have extra information that we need to provide. The recertification uh, process basically means we have to submit an initial packet all over again. So it's almost like you're doing everything and all the paperwork all over again, and it will include the diagnosis, scoring, demographics, the waiver certification family assurance form. And then again, the family once approved will receive a new medication Medicaid application. They have to um, recomplete and resubmit. And we also have have to complete an updated IPOS along with a wraparound plan. Now for third year recertifications, it gets a little tricky as I kind of hinted earlier. So technically speaking, SCD waiver is only for a year. So prior to 10-119, the state was a little bit more flexible and was allowing us to have families receive um, SCD waiver for two to three, even four years. However, now that SCD waiver is statewide, their criteria has become a little bit more strict and they have, um, they really look at cases with a lot more scrutiny because they want to make sure that individuals who really, really, really can benefit from these services and really need these benefit services are the ones who are uh, getting recertified. Um, so for third year, if there is one, there is no guarantee that the that the family is going to get their SED waiver for another year. We will process it and submit it to MDHHS and then they will let us know if they approve them or not. Sometimes they will and sometimes they have not. They have denied as well. So between 60 to 30 days prior to the expiration date is when we try we try to get all the paperwork ready. And for these particular cases, they want to look at CAFIS, PECFIS, DECA, any current assessments, evaluations, wraparound plans, IPOS. They want to look at the last three months of billing. And basically what that means is that they want to look at services. How many services has the family engaged in? You know, not just home-based therapy and wraparound, but also any type of ancillary services. Are they take, are they utilizing CLS, respite, art therapy, summer camps? What else are they utilizing, you know, basically to show that they really are in dire need of, of these extra services to continue for another year? And then if they do get approved, then, um, Kim and Marissa will let the providers know. Um, and then we move forward from there. Now, in an event that there is a denial, let's say that we do, did submit a for recertification and it was denied, what happens in that process? Well, if it is denied, then SED waiver lead is going to, which is Kim in this particular incident, will be sending out a letter and notice of disenrollment to the family and with that they will um, have an option for applying for a notice of uh, information about a notice of fair hearing and then they can follow through with the due process department which is handled by Benita Brown um, in case they want to move forward in that direction. But at our end, if let's say a, that a family is denied and they no long, they are okay with that decision, then what we do is we basically go ahead and disenroll the family in the WSA, which means once the family is closed out in WSA, their Medicaid will end, technically speaking, and their waiver ends as well. So at that point, um, it is really important that the home-based therapist and wraparound facilitators are working with the family and making sure that there's adequate transition planning. Now, currently what is happening is because of COVID-19, the state has allowed us ex an extension with all, all, all sorts of denials because they wanna ensure that we do have enough time for adequate transition planning with families and the families are feeling confident and and they're feeling um, good about the services they have in place and they're able to move with those services and um, they'll be okay, okay with that especially because of this this time period um, you know is really tough on families so we want to ensure that they are okay and we're just not leaving them high and dry.
So once the denial moves forward, PIHP must in provide parents with the notice of denial and right for Medicaid fair hearing. And like I mentioned earlier, a notice of denial must uh, document the specific reason for denial based on the SCD waiver eligibility criteria, which is outlined in the Medicaid provider man manual. And like we said earlier, SCD waiver is a pathway to Medicaid. So once the SCD waiver ends for those traditional families who were receiving Medicaid through SCD waiver, uh, the Medicaid will end as well. And here's an information of who can exercise the right to request a Medicaid fear hearing. It could be the family as well as a judge um, can request that as well. So moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about choice voucher. I'm not going to go in too much in detail because from OCHN's perspective, we have uh, we have asked the providers, which is Easter Seals and OFS, to handle choice voucher. So both both providers have their own internal processes of how choice vouchers work. Easter Seals has been working with choice voucher for a very long time, which basically is another way of seeing self determination, but and and they just uh, are following the same process, I believe, for children's. OFS um, has just started working with choice vouchers, so they're a bit new, but Debbie um, is the one that we have been working with. So if you guys have any questions about self-determination slash choice voucher and how it is uh, works for OFS, please contact Katie and Debbie. And for again, for Easter Seals, please contact Cassandra if you have any particular questions. So basically what choice voucher is as of 10 one the state said that we must allow individuals who are approved and eligible for SCD waiver for with the choice voucher as well. And this is something that we let them know during access screening. And this is also something they should be. Uh, this information should be shared with them during an intake. Um, and basically that is this is not an option for foster care parents actually just want to reiterate this is only for traditional families and families should be educated on choice voucher and offered the option to self-direct during the pre-planning me meeting and basically um, they'll be able to have um, a whole team that works with them so basically uh, service provider training consists of a combination of mandated training at a minimum and a choice voucher um, choice family choice of training topics and roles and responsibility of current and future supports identified through the wraparound plan and IPOS. So this should be identified in the IPOS as for the wraparound facilitator as well as home based therapy as well. Um, there must be an employer of record who has to uh, with the legal guardian uh, le and some type of support with knowledge, expertise, and choice of voucher, self-directed services. This could be a family member or a wraparound coordinator or an employer agent, which could be an FI and um, a family directed service provider. So ch choice voucher basically is a teamwork in, an, in a simple sense. It's a team of individuals that are identified by the individual as well as the family to help the individual um, with their services. So they can, they have the freedom to hire uh, whoever they would like for their services. And once roles and responsibilities and uh, services have been identified, then there is a budget and who really is responsible for this budget. So a lot of this is made simple for you guys because both Easter Seals and OFS are actually in contracts with FIs and the FIs are the ones who will handle all of the budget and everything. So a lot of the work has been taken from you, so you don't have to worry about a lot of it. You just have to make sure that you're working in connection with the FI because they will do most of the hiring of the staff um, and the family and the individual uh, have the choice of fire a staff if they feel that that a staff is not serving um, them the way they would like. So that is 
a really key component of having working with an FI. Family will have the freedom and authority to schedule, hire, fire, sign on timesheets, train staff directly, choose wages, and identify areas they need supports to successfully manage their employees. And typically, the FI will perform activities related to payroll, budget management, and HR, including background checks, completing IRS forms for employment taxes, and tracking training. And um, you can check with your provider, um, which is OFS and Easter Seals, which FIR they contracted with. Um, hopefully, there's a choice of at least two FIs. Um, if not, then they will be able to give you more information about which FIs they're in contract with that you can share the, that information with the family. So far, technically, we have not had even one family asked for the choice voucher under a CD waiver. So I don't know if this may come up in the future, but so far we have not had any one ask for it. The other thing I briefly want to talk about is autism benefit and SAD waiver. Now, if someone is already in ABA services through CMH, they cannot get SAD waiver. However, if someone is eligible for SCD waiver and is able to get SCD waiver and starts working with an SCD waiver team. And then later it's identified that that individual has some ABA concerns or needs or would benefit from some ABA therapy. Then we can provide some ABA services to that individual. So it's very important that you understand the difference. Someone receiving ABA services through CMH cannot get SCD waiver, but someone on SCD waiver can receive ABA services. Uh, so you basically want to look at it as a program rather than actually getting into the ABA CMH services. If a child on SCD waiver is diagnosed with aut autism, the child can receive ABA and still remain on SCD waiver. And basically they'll be able to access a behavior specialist and work with an AB ABA. And if you need more information how to do that, for Easter Seals, please talk to Cassandra, and for um, for OFS, please talk to Katie or Debbie. And for autism services, children with significantly challenging behaviors, self-harm, property destruction, aggression, can access behavior specialist, which is a BCBA or a BCABA. Um, and they're both qualified professionals with expert training in behavior modifications. And here's, here's the three codes that that can be utilized for the with the for a child on the SCD waiver, the H0031, which is functional behavior assessment, H0032, which is behavior treatment planning, and then S5111, which is family training. The other thing I do want to mention is that we also have peer support partners and youth peer supports as well, both at Easter Seals and OFS. And I know a lot of our families have benefit from benefited from those programs as well. Um, I also happen to oversee those programs and I know that those those all those individuals work really hard. So feel free to make referrals for PSPs and Y YPS uh, as well for the SCD waiver families because that is a great great benefit for for them. And then here's a link if you would like to get more information and each uh, pers uh, each PIHP has an autism coordinator as well at our agency OCHN. My coworker actually, she sits on the provider network team, Jennifer uh, Van Cleave is the autism coordinator and basically oversees all of the ABA services in Oakland County. So if you ever need any specific information on ABA, you can always contact her. But if you have questions regarding ABA services for or an ABA program for a person with SCD waiver, then please contact Kim. OK, having said that, we are in the question section, but I, what I wanted to go over real quickly is earlier when we were talking about uh, um, Cassandra was mentioning about going, uh, adding the benefit plan, SCD waiver benefit plan. One of the changes that we recently made and we send out a memo in regards to that, that previously when a person would open, individual would open with the SCD waiver uh, for an SCD waiver, we will wait till they get a approval for the SCD waiver. So in the meantime, we will add the H201 
0001 code for wraparound. However, now we changed it with the new memo. So now the expectation is that once the person is approved for a CD waiver and comes to the provider, you will when you add it when you are adding the authorizations for wraparound, please use the H2022 code, which is the wraparound for SCD waiver code. Right from the beginning, you do not have to wait for the actual letter for SCD, appro SCD waiver approval. We're just going to go ahead and put them in the with the correct authorizations along with the SCD waiver benefit plan. And that's really, really important because we've had some issues on our end um, because of the switching back and forth between the two codes, the H2021 and the H2022. So, so the H2022 is the wraparound SED waiver code, and that's the one that I want to see in the wraparound authorizations for SED waiver individuals. So, uh, I will come back to questions. I want to show you guys this information. Here is the contact information for myself, Kim, Katie, Cassandra, Marissa, and um, Brittany. So if you have any questions about the SCD waiver, I encourage you highly to go to your um, lead people at your uh, agencies and for me uh, from my perspective it would be Cassandra for Easter Seals, Katie um, from OFS and um, or Debbie and then Marissa for Oakland Schools and Brittany from MDHHS and for whatever reason you still have a question or a concern then feel free to reach out to Kim and then if you still have other concerns then feel free to reach out to me. Um, and we will be more than happy to solve any issues or concerns. The other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, one of the reasons why we decided to do these trainings is because with the audit, the SED waiver audit, we did not do as well as had expected. So because of that, it was very important that we share this information. We want to make sure that you guys have a basic understanding of what the SED waiver is, what it looks like in our county, what is our what is our eligibility criteria, how we determine a child. Um, receives an SCD waiver. The other thing I wanted to address really quickly is that it's really important that we all work together as a team. So the five of us actually work very closely together and we work really well together. Um, and so I really want that to be mirrored uh, countywide and uh, provider wide as well. So if you guys have questions and concerns about SCD waiver individuals, uh, please come to us and let us know uh, because it's better for us to problem solve uh, ahead of time um, instead of like later on having like a, a bigger issue. The other thing I wanted to address real quickly is that we've had a lot of uh, complaints in the last year that have come to customer service and I'm not blaming anyone, but is, these are just concerns that were brought to us by families that, fa that um, you know, families would be like, oh, you know, my waiver is ending or they're closing my waiver and, and you know, the therapist or the facilitator, whoever said to us, they don't agree with this decision, that they had nothing to do with this uh, and they're against this and this is all OCHN. So I would really encourage that, you know, we do not make these type of statements because like I said, and we went over the presentation to let you guys know that this is not um, something that we we're making personal decisions. This is based on the MDHHS Medicaid criteria. And, you know, we on the SED waiver committee, it is a decision made by a team. It's not one person's decision and it's all based on evaluating the criteria. So once a decision has been made, it is really important that we're all supporting each other and we're all in agreement of, of you know, whatever direction the waiver is moving forward. So having said that, I am now going to open it to questions. Marissa, please let us know the questions. I am going to um, 
uh, stop the presentation because I'm going to get the link guys and I'm going to post it in the chat. If you would like to receive a certificate, you have to complete the survey that and I'm going to put the link in the chat that has to be completed in order for you to receive a certificate for today's training. So I'm going to end the sharing my screen so I can get the link and post it in chat. But Marissa, please go ahead and let us know question number one. Okay. Um, Question really quick, wait, oh. Marissa, before you do that, I just wanted to add, um, I just had some additional uh, feedback I wanted to add before we get into that, especially considering we've got a little bit more time left on this training than we did when we did it last week. So just to kind of piggyback on what Nada said, um, one of the things, and we did not focus a lot on that today, but um, that's very um significant in the SED waiver is the ancillary services. So just wanted to uh, no, let you know that um, we're going to have an, a future training. So I'm looking for some feedback, hopefully in your surveys, or hopefully some of you have already got questions in the chat earlier, you know, related to that, because that is also an um, area that's kind of been identified and we didn't really cover it for the purposes of, like I said, of not kind of overwhelming you guys today, but just looking at the process around identifying and authorizing ancillary services for the SED waiver too, and, and the impact that that can have on the recertification process as well. So um, keep that in mind for the, especially, I'm really dependent on those of you who have extensive um, experience in working with the SED waiver, like what were some of the barriers um, that you, you have run into when trying to identify and authorize um, many of those ancillary services that are available for the SED waiver. Thank you. Right. And with ancillary services, usually we're pretty good with that. We will discuss in our SED waiver if anyone wants camps. You know, there's a certain number of CLS and respite that the SED waiver plan, benefit plan allows. But with the SED waiver, they can get more than those hours. And that's not an issue as at all. If a family is interested, uh, you know, we are more than happy if there is a medical, if it's medically necessary, we're more than happy than giving them extra hours of respite and CLS. You know, we've also heard parents say that, you know, we're told that, no, you cannot get any more than this. So, you know, we never want to make those type of comments because we will let the committee decide of what is medically necessary and how, how many hours a family can get. If they're asking for more, please let us know the requests and we'll move forward with them. I know with the camps, we do go through a specialist review because that's just how the clinical team would like to set it up. So, so we're working with the clinical team, um, you know, and part of changing the code was part of that because we knew that there were some issues with going back and forth and it was causing a lot of confusions and delays. So we were able to get that code for wraparound change and hopefully that will um, what that will make the process go a lot smoother. So having said that, Marissa, please let us know question number one. You know, I don't know if we talked about this earlier or not, too, but another one of those decisions um, that goes back to the committee, too, has to do with closing out SED waiver cases. So it's one of those, um, it's a state, uh, the state makes the ultimate decision, but also kids should not be due processed and closed that are on the SED waiver unless it goes through all of those steps. I think most people know that now, but just in case, just to, to bring that back up again, because I don't think we talked about that. Um, all right, so first question. Um, does the hospitalization eligibility criteria apply for those children who are under the age of four? Kim, I'm going to let you answer that question. Okay, I think I have the answer, but before I do, I would like for whoever asked that to, I guess, maybe clarify clarify that a little bit because I think I do understand the it question. Was from Deborah Singer. She just yeah, she just wants to know if that hospitalization criteria is required in order to make a child eligible um, for kids who are younger than four, if I'm understanding this. Yeah, I was just wondering because uh, from the way I understood the hospitalization criteria, part of it has to do with like medical management as well. Um, like they can't be managed at a lower level of care. And 
I mean, I think it would just be very hard to justify hospitalizing a child that young. So I was just wondering, is that applicable to our younger or really young kids? Yeah, we've never had a case of anyone that young because like you just said, it's usually not applicable to hospitalized child that age. Kim? Yeah, yes, thank you for further clarifying that. That's what I assumed you were asking, but I, I wanted to make sure before you know I answered that to make sure I answered your, your question appropriately. And that's basically like a two part answer. Um, if you would recall earlier where we talked about, and I think was your question related, I think you did you start with the age of four and younger? I believe that. Which yeah. Is question. So, yeah, so that's kind of the purpose of a little bit of time we're talking about is that the eligibility criteria is slightly different. If you recall, I mentioned that a child um, that age would only need to have one moderate um, impairment on the PECFIS related to that. So, so yeah, while we're while we're looking at that, um, which let me pull that up to give you an example to make sure I'm clear, you know, on my response, I'm going to go to the link in that slide really quick to show you that how that could that could be applicable. But then, of course, like you said, it's pretty difficult at, um, for someone that age because one, they're not likely to be on medications either at that age. So we would not be of course, we would not be able to use that criteria. Um, for a child that age, which makes this a very good question you're asking, but give me one second. I'm trying to go back to find the slide with the link to um, to the state um, MDHHS criteria, and I can give you an example. There we go. On how that on how we would use that, and also how we would not. So, so let me get that pulled up really quick. I thought when you click in the link, it'll open right up. Let's see, there we go. Open link. Okay. So just to reiterate while I'm waiting on that to waiting on that to load. Oh God, we put the whole Medicaid manual. <laughs> thought it, I thought that link was specifically to that part, but let me lit up. But yes, yeah, so I'll go to go back to reiterate that's we are using we are using that for the things that would be applicable to a child that's four years older, you know, or younger. Like you said, ideally a four year old or younger will not be on any medication. So we would not be looking at that per se, but there is another which I want to quote it exactly section in there that would make that child eligible based on this criteria, which my sheet if that if that makes um if that makes any sense. With the, before I pull that up though, but does that kind of partly answer your question, Deborah? I know it doesn't has uh -huh. I haven't answered it all the way yet. Yeah. Yeah. I always get confused by that last section on the waiver application where it's, it talks about the meta, you know, the eligibility for the state hospital, about and what right, exactly those things mean and how they apply to our younger kids. More, right? Which, yeah, that makes sense. That's why that's a that's a very good question. Which now I'm trying to go through and find my own little checklist. Considering the link is actually to the Medicaid uh, manual we have in the PowerPoint, I thought it was specifically to that section. So go. Can you go ahead with the next question while I find that on my computer, Marissa, and we can come back to sure. Deborah's question, which is that's an excellent question, by the way. <laughs> I knew it was a good question. See that, Deborah? Okay. <laughs> um, so Lynn, the next question is from Lindsay, uh, wraparound facilitator, and she says, our SED waiver service is being adjusted to meet the needs of our families during COVID-19 pandemic. As overnight summer camps and fire are not offered available at this time, and added difficulty securing the CLS and respite workers. Um, I do know we do have access to Spring Hill um, for overnights this year, but I do think that is the only overnight provider. So that is the question.
Okay, so I was, I was, I don't know why, but I felt like I was waiting for someone to answer, and then I realized, okay, maybe I'm the one who's supposed to be answering. <laughs> so I'm getting ready to say that that's an outpike with a dark question. <laughs> So, um, you know, the thing is that we at OCHN, there's been um, a lot of modif modifications with certain services. We've gone to telehealth for a lot of things, you know, and then there's a lot of things that we're just not able to go through telehealth. A lot of the providers or, or you know, um, agencies in our community that are where we have been utilizing for the ancillary services are just not open and not offering any services. So, unfortunately, at this time, we're all brainstorming and trying to figure out what would be good resources or activities that we can refer um, families to because it is pretty, pretty hard to find any. Um, Marissa, I'm going to let you jump in because as the wraparound lead, have you found any other types of services that we can refer to parents and families? It is definitely a challenge right now. I think my understanding is that CLS and respite has been kind of mixed. Um, some families are able to access it still. Some have not been able to. Okay. Some okay. don't want it um, in their homes and some very much would okay. still like to utilize those services. Um, it is my understanding that FAR is not offering services right now um, during the pandemic, but hopefully that gets back online soon. And like I mentioned before, I believe Spring Hill is the only overnight unless someone knows differently that is operating as of right now. Yeah, and I think a lot of uh, various organizations or even online, there's a lot of online games that are happening. There's online reading clubs or, or you know, um, things like of that nature, maybe uh, by different types of school boards or schools that have been po put out or programs by libraries. Um, where you can like join through Zoom sessions. So there's there's a lot of interactive activities like that. But oh, yes. again, pardon? All right, I was just gonna say, oh, there's a ton. There's a ton, a ton of resources that are offered that are, are different than what we might normally offer, but they're right. they're different than, you know, the CLS and respite that we're used to providing. I know some people are doing CLS and respite online too, in some way or fashion. I don't know how they're doing that. Um, and then I know wraparound facilitators should have a plethora of resources for activities and support groups and things like that too, that we should be able to offer to families during this time as well. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we're all brainstorming. If you actually, if anyone finds something, we, we are usually very good at sharing. So if I find something, I will send it out. And if anyone else finds something, please share with everyone um, because we're all in the same bo boat and we're all really trying to find as many resources for, for our families in the network as well as our personal families as well. For sure. Next question. Um, there is not another question on here unless someone wants to write one in and then we'll make sure it gets addressed. But right now there are no other questions no, on here. Lisa, I, this is Cassandra. I have a question. Um, when you get a chance, can you email me the, um, the current wraparound referral? I don't know if you have it in a Word document format. I do. The one I have is in a PDF. And so because we're not able to, you know, go to the office and print like we used to, um, as much, um, that would be help if I can have it in a Word document so sure. that I can type on it. Yep. yep. Okay. And I, I was able to pull up um, to go back to Deborah Singer's question. It says I'm sharing my screen, but I only see Cassandra on my screen. So I don't know. Can somebody you can know if you can yeah, see? I, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So going back to answer the other part of um, Deborah's question, I have that intensity of service part pulled up, which I believe is that the part you were referring to, Deborah? When yeah. you said, okay. So, yeah. So if you look at the, uh, um, bullet points that are available on there while the first two do basically talk about um, psychotropic medica medications there are a couple of other ones down here that would that would or could apply to a um a four-year-old or younger for instance like I'm, I'm going to go to the third um bullet point which says continuous observation and control of behavior 
And then it gives a couple of examples there. Isolation, restraint, closed unit, suicidal, homo homicidal is needed to protect the beneficiary, others, and or property or to contain the beneficiary so that treatment may occur. So um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that that, you know, that that would be the one because keep in mind for this particular session of the criteria they do only have to meet one of these so i can see how that could relate to a four-year-old based on cases that providers have bought to the waiver committee or cases that i've assessed myself you know meaning that the child does have some suicide you know significant suicidal or homicidal behaviors or, and participates in you know severe property destruction you know such as fire setting um, which is a more one of the more common ones or you know other property destruction to the home you know mm -hmm. so can you see where that may be applicable you know to um, a four-year-old or a three-year-old in this case because we have had we have had someone as young as three on the um, SED waiver yeah sure. so okay, that, that so not with that does that make sense or answer answer yeah. your question okay thank thank you for your patience while I located that <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is Deborah. Yeah, the questions happy to come in the chat. OK, go ahead. Oh, I just thought of another question kind of based off of Lindsay's question about the ancillary services. Um, when you were talking about um, like when they look at renewing the waiver, if um, there have been barriers because of the pandemic to utilizing some of those ancillary services, is that something the state takes into consideration like that? You know, the family may have wanted far and been in the process of doing it, but then they haven't been able to utilize it. Uh, yes, they do take that into consideration on an individualized um, case basis. Um, for example, um, just to kind of go in and give an additional example of what I'm referring to for someone who this would be a second year renewal. Um, and let's say they started services. Uh, let's see where we're coming up on. Uh, and we we're about to be in August. So let's say they started anytime September 1st of 2019 and, and later. They're definitely taking a look at considering we're going into our fourth, uh, we're finishing up our fourth month right now of the pandemic of looking at um, providing an extension, as Nada mentioned earlier, about allowing a family to, you know, remain on the waiver if it happens to go past their, like, let's say I use September, for example, they're going to take a look at that because right now we're getting ready to get into August and this and this child would have been impacted by the pandemic from March through September, which is six months. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, they're definitely, you know, looking at that per se, but then I know we have some uh, cases which the dot went into about earlier that maybe be three years or longer. And I don't think they are really taking that into consideration. Have we gotten a response from MDHS yet? No, we have not, but I can tell you that they're not going to be, you know, as, um, lenient as far as taking that into consideration if we've had someone on the waiver three years or more and there weren't any other ancillary you know services provided or if the services maybe started maybe prior to um the pandemic and you know they haven't been able to be utilized because of um the pandemic does that make sense yes and in addition to that um and like we talked about earlier, when it comes to utilization and that the treatment plan is like a living document, um, if a family is not able to use FAR at this time, Kim and Adad, are, should we be updating that treatment plan? And make it like, because if there's often there and, or there's an objective for FAR and they, they're not going to be able to use it right now, should that still be indicated in the treatment plan as an option of a service? I don't think you need to go as far as updating the treatment plan. The last directive I remember when I followed up with our UM or UR department was just to make sure that that's being clearly documented, you know, um, in your progress, you know, in your progress notes. Um, if that's the reason that's preventing, you know, the family from accessing the services. I'll double check that though really quick. I'm going to go back to that email though to um, confirm, okay? 
Okay, thank you. Because I know it's different from CLS and respite. With CLS and respite, they are still able to provide some type of CLS and respite service. Um, but where it's far is it's not an option at all right now. So when they're doing that higher scrutiny at the state too, I, I find them to be very collaborative with us. Um, and they'll ask us questions like, I don't see any CLS or respite. Do you know why? Or I'm assuming they would say, you know, it looks like they want FAR services, but they haven't been provided. Is that just during the pandemic or did they not utilize it before? They're, they're pretty open to, you know, discussions and conversations before they make a um, determination or a ruling. I think, okay. I think they're pretty collaborative. Okay. Yeah, we definitely want to make sure we're documenting because we did get cited on that a lot with, um, with our cases with ancillary services not being used. Any other comments, guys? Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hands. I also um, posted the link here for you guys to complete the survey. I see people are leaving. Please make sure that you complete the survey in order to get the certificate. So I think this must be it. I don't think anyone else has any questions. And as I, I see a lot of people leaving too, so just want to reiterate that in those surveys per se, they give us feedback for the next training, which is going to be focused on identifying and authorizing services, ancillary services. And, um, you know, like I said, if there's any barriers, you know, related to that, so we can make sure we, you know, equip them with all of the information that you need um, in order and identifying, authorizing and um, having the families utilize ancillary services um, with the SED waiver. Yep. And with that, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day and the rest of the week, which is Fridays tomorrow and a great weekend. Um, yeah. Take care. Bye, D, because I've been able to see you the whole time. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Yeah, I'm scared too, D. Good thing you didn't do anything strange. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's very Bye. nice to see you guys. <laughs> All right. Hi, Good seeing you. you virtually, Marisa. Yeah, you too. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi, Oh, Marisa. hey, Jalen. Hey. Who's pronouncing your name incorrectly? It's Marisa, correct? It's Marisa, yes. Hi, Jalen. Well, oh, it's it's me, because I say Marisa, Marissa, <laughs> okay. whatever. All right. It's like, Just make Marisa, sure we like have a Marisa together. Together. We got it. For that long, long and I was pronouncing your name wrong. <laughs> no, you got it. <laughs> All right. Bye. I'll see you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. I was I was struggling to see the link. It's not coming up on my computer. It's in the chat. I know. I'm looking for it. it. Do you want me to send it to you, Deb? Can you please send it to me? I got you. Thank you, because yeah. I want to make sure I get the credit for it, and I've been on this thing the whole time. That's <laughs> right. right. I okay. saw you. I saw Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> How are <All> you? Right. <laughs> see you. OK, take care. Thank you so you much. Too. Oh, hi, right. Carmen. Hey, Carmen. Hey, Carmen. Hey, it's so nice. Hey, Carmen, I, I will everybody. see you in like 30 seconds, okay? Yay. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's like 15 minutes, but I'll see you soon, okay? You know what? We're never letting go of Carmen. She's stuck with us forever. Oh, Carmen, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> but I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right. We still have a lot of people left. Yeah. Yes, we do. And I'm trying to make polls because I see that question. Cassandra was strictly related to respite and CLS. So I'm trying to get you an answer, which probably will happen in the next few minutes about um, FAR. Okay. <laughs>